our scripture reading will come from Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 through 15. Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 through 15, and this is the word of God. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. This is the word of God. Thanks. Once again, I want to say to you, happy Father's Day to all fathers here. Happy Father's Day. And happy Father's Day to all of you. Happy Lord's Day. Happy Father's Day. Yes. Today, uh, what we are going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to approach this text in an apologetical way, meaning that giving you our reason for hope, our reason for hope, why we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the reason of that hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, logical reasonings based on this text and from this text. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, But in your heart, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a difference to anyone who asks you for reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. It says, always be prepared to make a difference about your faith. Why do you believe that? Why are you being hopeful in this situation, even in this moment? Such as your reason for that hope, hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you and I, we should be able to explain and defend our faith. And I think that is exactly what Matthew is doing here in this text. A text on the resurrection of Jesus Christ has been made back then, a long time ago, and even now in the modern day, still now. It is not hard to find some documentary film or some TV programs that being skeptical on the resurrection of Jesus, made by some educated scholars. Was Jesus really risen? The mystery, the secret about the resurrection of Jesus. And these scholars, liberal scholars, try to explain what happened, what really happened in their own theory. So I'm going to share some of the few theories that are popular out there that you may be aware of. Oh, I didn't know. I want you to know about it. And theory one is soon known as a swoon theory, that Jesus never died. That the, they deny the death of Jesus Christ. Actually, on this one I shared with you a couple of weeks ago. They say that the pains of the crucifixion was so severe, so great, overwhelming, that Jesus fell into coma or shock. He fainted. So they, when they placed Jesus in the tomb, they thought Jesus died, but Jesus was not actually died. When they placed Jesus in the cool tomb, the cool air of the tomb and the spices they put on Jesus' body woke him up, and so Jesus walked out of the tomb. But we must remember this. The death of Jesus Christ was not confirmed, not only by those friendly party of Jesus, but it was confirmed by the enemies of Jesus as well. The Roman soldiers, the chief priests, the religious, Jewish religious leaders, they all confirmed that Jesus is dead, as you can see from this passage. Roman soldiers were professional executioners. There, in the biblical story, they did not break Jesus' leg while they did to the other criminals, other crucified ones, because they already saw that Jesus is already dead. So instead of breaking Jesus' leg, which they have done it to speed up the process of death, they saw Jesus already dead. So instead of that, they 
pierced Jesus' side with the spear and made it sure that he is dead. The Roman centurion confirmed it. So the pilot, as we saw last time, gave the body, the dead body of Jesus, to Joseph for burial. The chief priests were also the eyewitnesses of Jesus' death. They were there. They were there and making sure that one that Jesus died, that these people did not deny. What they tried to deny and cover up was the resurrection of Jesus, not the death of Jesus. If Jesus was not dead, but he was simply severely injured in that bad condition, on the third day, that he was able to wake, remove the giant stone, fight this combat-trained Roman soldiers, and escape from their place, I can hardly see that. What scripture is telling us is that Jesus was not merely recovered, but he was risen. Second theory is a hallucination theory. Other scholars try to explain this, the resurrection, by saying that they wanted to see just they wanted to see Jesus so bad, they all saw hallucinations of Jesus. But how can the entire group, over 500 people, can have and share exact same hallucination of Jesus. All seeing the same. You know, hallucination is very individual. You don't share that. They all saw the exact same hallucination at the same time responding to the same hallucination. In the letter of the, to the Corinthian church, the apostle Paul emphasized the importance of the resurrection of Jesus. And he shared the, how many people witnessed this, that this is a historical fact. This is what he says, 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. He appeared 500 people at once, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, James, I'm guessing the brother of Jesus, that James. Then to all the apostles, last of all, as to the untimely born, he appeared also to me. We are talking about eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Hallucination? No, they claimed. Some of them are still alive, and Paul said, you can go talk to them. Some of them have fallen asleep, died, but some of them are still alive. They claim not that they only saw Jesus, they touched Jesus. If all of them are having a same hallucination, how can they touch him who is only an illusion? Actually, Jesus ate with them. The Gospel of Luke tells us this. Luke 24, verse 39. See my hands, Jesus is saying. And my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have a flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he has said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. They physically handed a fish to Jesus, and Jesus ate it, and the fish was gone. The physical fish he gave, Jesus ate, so the fish was gone. This is, we are not talking about hallucination or illusion here. Theory three, Jesus was not placed in the tomb, but he was thrown into Gehenna. The wall the world, hell, 
that we use has association with this place, Gehenna. Gehenna, Gehenna was a real place known as a valley just outside of the city of Jerusalem. This is where the dead body of the criminals, rebels, or wicked people were thrown to, and these dead bodies were piled up, and one day they burned it all. This, is, was, this place was known as a cursed place. And as you can see, why this place became the motive or metaphor for hell. The wicked, dead, burned. Now, some people said that Jesus, after the crucifixion, he was not placed in the tomb. He was not buried in the tomb because he was crucified as a rebel. He was actually thrown into this place, the valley of Gehenna. That's why the tomb was empty. He was not even there from the beginning. They all went to that empty place while Jesus was actually thrown into this place. That makes no sense to me. Hardly believe that this was an explanation made by educated scholars because then these chief priests and the Roman soldiers basically sealed and guarded for three days a wrong place. And they didn't even check. If Jesus was thrown into the belly of Gehenna, who would have done that? It would have been done by the Roman soldiers. These people. And if they have done this, and they don't even know that this place is completely empty, why should we guard this place? For Jesus' body, we throw over there. It's, it's not here. They would not guard the meaningless place for three days. So, if anybody at this time claimed that Jesus is risen, they can just go and pick up the dead body of Jesus from the valley of Gehenna. Theory four, similar. Basically, they are saying they went to a wrong tomb. Person like Croson, he argued that they went to a wrong tomb. Jesus was actually buried at a different tomb, different grave. And all these people went to a wrong tomb and saw that was empty and they, ah, Jesus is risen. And I think that is, this is ridiculous too. All the soldiers guarded the wrong tomb. In, even those women went to the wrong tomb and saw the empty, <gasps> Jesus' reason. Well, we got to remember this. Jesus was not buried in any random tomb. He was buried at the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the rich man, his own property. The one maybe possibly he prepared for himself, but he offered that to Jesus. So after all this, nobody was able to clarify this. When the resurrection claim was made, and even the Joseph of Arimathea, he did not know his own properties. Oh, uh, actually, that's not it. This is my tomb. You see, Jesus' body is still here. No one was able to clarify this. No Roman soldiers. No chief priest, no disciple, no woman, not even Joseph. Theory five is a theft theory that the disciples came by night and stole the body of Jesus, which Matthew in our text deals with it. Modern day scholar, what they are saying and what the chief priest thought about long time ago, not much different. Not much different. Let's go back and read Matthew 27. We already read this before, but let's pay attention to what happened there. See what they were thinking. Verse 62. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how the imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days, I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, take, make it as secure as you can. 
So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. If you have ESV Bible with you and you read this passage, you probably can see a small tiny note in verse 65 next to you have there. And it says the original Greek can also be translated as take. In other words, Pilate was saying to the chief priest, saying, take you, take these soldiers, Roman soldiers, and secure the tomb as much as you can. Make sure, do not let that happen. They steal the body and claiming that. They took this seriously. So Roman soldiers were guarding it. Don't you think the soldiers were told how important it is to guard this tomb? Especially to pay attention on the third day. Because he said, I will rise on the third day. Well, let's say, if you were informed by some intelligent agency, FBI, or somehow, somehow they knew it, and they tell you, you know what, someone's trying to come into your house and steal something precious, they're planning on this Tuesday. So be careful, this Tuesday. Don't you think that you will pay extra attention and strengthen the security all the more on Tuesday, from today until this Tuesday, and more on Tuesday. It was told to them, in three days, on the third day, he said he will rise. I think they would take this really seriously. What chance do you think the disciples would have against these combat-trained Roman warriors? We know what happened on the third day, on the Sunday morning, Matthew 28, 2 to 4, it says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow. And for the fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Probably, they were prepared for fight for any, for any sort of. If anyone approaching, any potential threat, or any group of men approaching, it seems like they're going to steal the body, they will stay alert and ready for a fight, especially on the third day from the morning till night. But what happened on that Sunday morning was not what they expected. They never seen anything like this before. They realized that this is beyond themselves. There were fierce soldiers of Rome, probably went through many dangerous battles and fights. But at the appearance of this holy angel, which was beyond human power and domain, fear swallowed them up. Their hands were numb. Their legs were moving. They fell down like a dead man and trembling. Some managed to escape, ran away from the place. Some of them, as our passage says, only some came back to the city and told the chief priest, what happened? That they testified that by supernatural, miraculous happening, they couldn't guard it. This resurrection happened. And the verse 12 of our text They gathered and had a council, discussing with each other what they should do. And this is what they came up with. Look at our passage, verse 13. And said, tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were Directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Let me point this out first to you. One, see the hardness of the sinful heart. Let me point that out. See the hardness of the sinful heart. Sin is so irrational, so foolish. Sin makes us 
that we cannot think right, we cannot discern it. Remember the serpent at the Garden of Eden to the woman about eating the forbidden fruit? If you eat of it, you'll be wise as God. It will give you wisdom. And that was a lie. Satan is a liar from the beginning. It was a lie. You sin, we cannot think correctly. We cannot discern. It makes us foolish, irrational. As the scripture tells, the people, the sinners, makes what is good, evil, calls what is evil, good. What is truth, lie. What is lie, that's the truth. Look at what's going on in this world. What is wrong, is that's good. What is good, is that's wrong. We don't have discernment. Think about this. Think about you and me. When the soldiers reported this to them, what should have been their responses? What should have been their responses when they heard this from the soldiers? Now remember, these Roman soldiers were not prodigious. Yet, these soldiers were testifying this. Because this is what really happened. They witnessed this. They were afraid of that angel and Jesus' reason. They couldn't do anything about it, so they were coming and telling the chief priest. And if this was so, then and that they are chief priests of God, they believed in God, then they should have investigated this, and if it is so, they should repent and really believe in Jesus. His reason. They demand a sign from Jesus. Show us a sign of your authority. And Jesus told them, I have no sign to give to you but the sign of Jonah. Just like Jonah was in the valley of fish and on the third day he came back. I will die and on the third day I will rise again. That's a sign. Nothing but that one. And the sign that they were seeking finally given to them. They have it here now. Now they got to be. As Jonah came back from the valley of fish and people believed that he was sent by God, now we know that he is sent by God. But instead of believing, they attempt to destroy the evidence. They try to cover it up with lie. You see how irrational they how irrational this is? They don't think right. This is how hardened the heart of the sinners. They refuse to believe. You know why? Because they don't want to. It's not the lack of evidence. It's like, I don't want to have God. I want me, myself, to be my God. I want to live my life in any way I want. I don't want to serve God and obey Him, no. Power, money, position, sex, and whatever that might be, I just want to do whatever I want to. I don't like it. Secondly, we see the sinful men rebelling against God here in their own effort, and their effort here was a lie. They try to rebel against God, what God is doing here. They fabricate a lie, and they bribe these soldiers with money to spread a lie. Go tell the people, evangelize the lie. Go evangelize the lie. Tell other people about this. And we will satisfy Pilate to keep you out of trouble. What what does that mean? What does that mean? That they will take care of Pilate. Now normally, Roman soldiers who slept on a guard or who left, deserted, or departed from the position for any reason, for any reason that they need to guard Keep the position, especially out of fear. Or if they lose their weapon in the battle out of fear. For anything like that, then they face a severe punishment, such as beating by sticks and stones. And which a lot of cases, and most of the cases, led them to death. And even if they survive, they had to face lifelong exile. So if you run away, fail to guard, you will face death or exile. So they were afraid. And the chief priest was saying that, don't worry, we will take care of the pilot. How? How are they going to take care of the pilot? 
Well, often these Jewish religious leaders, they reported to Rome, the Caesar, about all the bad things, about all the problems about their regional governors. They made a direct report to Rome. Rome, your governor here in this area have done this wrong. Uh, 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 uh. These people owned Pilate because they knew all the bad things, wrong things about Pilate. They can say to Pilate, Oh, if you don't cooperate with us, we will tell Caesar, we will report it to Rome. They owned Pilate to the point they made Pilate to crucify Jesus. You don't do this? You don't crucify Jesus? We will tell Caesar you are not a friend of Caesar's. You know what we're going to tell him. With their power, they try to secure tomb as much as they can. As Pilate told them, secure it as much as you can. And they failed. Now, they couldn't stop the resurrection of Jesus. Now, they try to cover up the truth with the lie as much as they can in their own power. Go spread the lie. Don't worry about this. We will take care of this. But they, it will not work again. All the efforts against God's work will not work. That's my third point. The lie, this lie, prove, actually proved the resurrection of Jesus. This lie actually proved the resurrection of Jesus. Think about this. Would you think with me? Why? Matthew wanted to put this towards the end of his gospel. I know. We are finally towards the end of the gospel, Matthew. Right? And why Matthew wanted to put this towards the end of his gospel? About the lie that spread in his contemporary. Lie made by the enemy. Doesn't he want to end his gospel in a more glorious way, including all the positive, warm testimony, friendly testimony, how glorious it was to see this resurrected Jesus? Why does he want to do this? Because, hear me, sometimes the evidence made by the enemy is much more powerful and stronger than friendly testimonies. It seems like the early Christians had to deal with attacks or skepticism on the resurrection of Jesus, as we do in the modern day. Matthew is well aware of that, his contemporary issue. Some people say, oh, I heard that Jesus' disciples stole the body. So he addressed that in his gospel. Once again, because sometimes the evidence, what the enemy said, is much more powerful than the friendly testimony. This is a lie, as Matthew puts at the end of our text, known by so many people till this day. And this proved the resurrection. Now reason with me. One, the disciples, they weren't capable of stealing the body, both mentally and in their skill. They fled, they ran away from Jesus when Jesus got arrested to save their skin, to save their neck. While he was still alive. Why now? After all, now Jesus is dead. They would risk their own life. For what? They didn't do it while he was alive. Why they would do that now after he is dead? Secondly, the authorities placed the Roman soldiers at the tomb, fishermen, tax collectors, farmers, they have no chance to overpower these combat-trained Roman warriors. Thirdly, for the Roman soldiers, as I told you, the cost of failing this is so big, it means their life. They can die or be exiled. But these people are going around and telling people, we failed! We failed. These disciples managed to steal the body over our watch. We failed. We failed. These prideful Roman soldiers basically going around and telling people, we failed. They managed. They were successful stealing the body. And the people see them. Oh, and the, you guys are walking totally fine. You got no trouble. It's safe and good. You, you guys are all good. Yeah, we failed. They stole the body. 
and we are good. And the people was like, wait, 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 something is not right here. This is fishy. What? You see? This is pathetic and pitiful ploy to cover up the truth. And people knew about this lie till this day. Fourthly, if the disciple really stole the body, that means they know that Jesus is dead. He's not resurrected. Then nearly all of them preached, lived for, and died for a lie that they came up with. Now they are willing to die for life. He's risen, he's risen. They had a full assurance, disciple, faith and confidence in the resurrection of Jesus to the point, according to Acts chapter 5, when Sanhedrin threatened them, if you preach again that Jesus is risen, you will be in trouble. You know what they said? This is how they responded, Acts chapter 5. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. We are not just telling the story that we heard. We are the witnesses. We saw him. We touched him. We walked with him. Not only Jesus' resurrection, as we saw in Matthew 27, 53, after Jesus' resurrection, there were many old saints came back to life, resurrected, and went into the city of Jerusalem and seen by many people. So, so many people in the city of Jerusalem, even if they did not see Jesus, Risen Jesus. They saw many old saints resurrected, appeared to them. And this was known to the, so many people. So by the time when Peter preached the gospel about this, we see in the book of Acts 2, so many people believed, repented, and turned to Jesus in faith in the city of Jerusalem. They attempted to spread a lie against God's Holy One but they actually spread the story that tomb is now empty. They made it sure the people know. The tomb is empty now. Unintentionally spread the truth. Nothing can stop what God is doing in history. Who can stand against the work of God and stop his hand? When God is making known, it will be known. And we are the witness of that. From this time till our modern day, throughout the world, we have heard the news that he is risen. Known by thousands and millions and millions of people. He is risen. God made it known. If the resurrection of Jesus did not happen in history, I'm almost done. Hear me. Then, the entire Christian faith and teaching rests on a lie because we teach and we believe that Jesus is risen. Our reason for hope about the coming kingdom, this is not a wishful thinking or an illusion. If the resurrection of Jesus is not a historical fact. Then God, who claimed in this book that he raised Jesus, if that did not happen, he's a liar. That God is a liar. Because he claimed here that he raised Jesus, which did not happen then. We have a solid and unshakable reason for hope, and this is why. We claim not just Jesus is merely a brilliant teacher, a great moral example, or a healer, or a charismatic leader. We claim that Jesus is the Lord of all because he's risen. He's a resurrected Lord. Romans 10.9 
Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess and believe that Jesus is Lord and he is risen, you will be saved. My friends, what is your heart response to this claim that he is risen? Where do you stand with this claim? And what does that mean to you? And this is a historical fact. Let's pray.